Salve te discipuli. We're going to talk about chapter 23 very briefly because there's not an awful lot involved in chapter 23 that requires anything unusual. They talk about two different things. One is the irregular verb feral. It's very common but very irregular and that's of course which makes a verb irregular is the fact that it's common. Feral, ferre, tuli, latus. Wow. It's a like, lot like the English, uh, English word uh, go, went, gone. It's just one principal part doesn't seem to have anything to do with the other. Let's make this a supine here by putting an M there. Uh, feral really is treated a lot like other verbs, uh, other regular verbs. It's the present tense that really has to, and the present tense is listed there at the very bottom of page 128. So it's feral, and you have to memorize this, feral, fares, fert, ferimus, fertis, and then ferunt. And it simply means to carry, to carry some. We get all kinds of uh, derivatives from this in English, like transfer and so on. Uh, you can see there, feral, fares, fert, ferimus, fertis, ferunt on the bottom of page 128. All of your irregular verbs are listed in one section in the back of the book, along with, uh, uh, along with uh, this verb here. For example, you have nolo and wolo, which we had in, in Latin 1. They both take uh, an infinitive as a complement, nolo and wolo there. And uh, ao, the verb to go, which has a lot of compounds with it, like trans ao, in ao. That kind of, I go. It's irregular in Spanish. It's irregular in French. And um, another one, of course, is the verb sum and possum. These are irregular verbs. So this is an opportunity in chapter 23 to review everything about irregular verbs. There's only about six irregular verbs in Latin. It's not that big of a deal. But you'll see these verbs popping up all over the place, and especially this, you'll wonder, how, what's that word? I tried to look it up and I couldn't find it. The reason you couldn't find it is because it's not listed as the first principal part. So you have to be aware of that. If I say, if I see tulit, that means he carried. And that's why you need to memorize the principal parts of common verbs, and you need to memorize the present tense of irregular verbs. For example, eo, is, it, imus, itis, erunt. It's an irregular declension, or excuse me, conjugation. Sum, s, s, sum, s, s, sunt. Nolo and wolo also have unusual present tenses, which you again will see in the back of the book. The book also talks about more about uses of the ablative case. And it's not a big deal, but it's important. You have ablative of manner. Ablative of means, ablative of accompaniment, these are all just labels. We use them all the time. Accompaniment, I'm just going to put, excuse my writing there. And ablative with certain adjectives. Ablative of manner, how we do something. He, he, he ran with great speed. I can say magna caleritate. He ran with great speed. This is ablative. Or I can put a preposition in there, magna cum caleritate. Put a cum in there. And that's called ablative of accompaniment, giving us the, the way it was done or the manner. And this is in the middle of page 129, further uses of the ablative. Um, there it is, there is summa celeritate or magna voce clamavit. You don't need a preposition there. You can just put it into the ablative. Um, you can also use, here's ablative of means. This was, uh, a, this was the manner here. Okay, Ablative of means is anything you do something with. For example, he kills him with a sword. You simply take the word that you're doing something with and put it in the ablative. He killed him, I'm going to use is for he, nekawit, there's several words for kill. He kills him, using English word order here, he kills him with a sword. I'm just going to take the word for sword, gladius, and make it ablative, gladio. There you are. 
And that means that that's what he did it with. He killed him, he killed him with a sword. No preposition is needed. No preposition. This is called the ablative of means. Whatever you do something with. Now, if I say he's walking with his mother, I've got to put kum in there because that's going to be ablative of accompaniment. If he's walking with his father, compatre. There it is. I do need to put kum in there if it's a person. If it's not a person, then it's called the ablative of means or instrument. And I simply put the word in the ablative case, and that's the end of it. There are a couple of adjectives also, like plena, meaning full, plenus, the adjective, the masculine form, and dignus, meaning worthy. And in English, we, we, we have the word of that comes after. He is, he is full of goodness. She is worthy of your love. You hear the word of in there. But in Latin, the next word would go into the ablative. Uh, worthy and plainness. They give you examples of that at the very bottom. Uinus dignus es laude. The young man is worthy of praise. Worthy of praise, laude, with no preposition. That is an E up there. And there's another example here. The pot was full of water, literally filled with water. So the pot was full, that'd be an A here because it's orna, and aqua would be put into the ablative without a preposition. Aqua, filled with water. And really, folks, that's all there is to chapter 23. It's very simple. And I'll see you soon for chapter 24. Multus gratis vobis ago. Salvete, discipuli. Today we're going to go cover chapters 24 and 25. We're going to take the two of them together because they both talk about the same idea of grammar, the comparison of adjectives in 24 and the comparison of adverbs in 25. So we'll put them together because it's all in the same idea. This is called in grammar the, the degrees of comparison. And of course, we have this in English also. For example, tall, taller, tallest. OK? In English, this is called the positive degree. When you're not comparing anything to anything, the girl is tall. So we've been dealing with the positive degree of the adjective all year long. Remember, there's two types of adjectives. There's a first and second declension adjective, and there's a third declension adjective. And we'll take them all together here. Taller, this is something new for us in Latin. This is the comparative degree. The comparative degree. And tallest would be the superlative degree. If you didn't know this in English, you're learning it now. The superlative degree of the adjective. OK. So we have positive, comparative, and superlative. And we see what that looks like in English. Tall, taller, tallest. What does it look like in Latin? OK. We already know the positive degree, altus. That would be a first and second declension adjective. Let's throw a third declension adjective in here just to cover everything. Here's fortis. Again, forgive my writing, but you're familiar with these words, F-O-R-T-I-S. How do we say something is taller or someone is braver, stronger? In English, we put E-R after the end of the adjective here. Or you could use a helping word like more. She is more beautiful. Or rather, she is rather beautiful. Both of those are comparative in English. In Latin, you take the stem of the adjective. And of course, how do we get our stem for adjectives and nouns? You cut off the genitive ending. And that leaves you with the stem. OK? In this case, we, we can cut off the nominative ending, too, and it wouldn't make any difference. But that's our general rule. When you want to find the stem of a noun or the stem of an adjective, you cut off the genitive ending, the genitive singular ending. Again, that's a repeat. Now, how are we going to make these comparative? We add IOR. IOR. Altior, fortior. You do the same thing regardless of whether or what type of adjective it is. Fortior means braver. Altior means taller. 
And these are both declined regardless of whether they're first and second or third declension adjectives. In the comparative degree, they're both declined in the third declension. So they're treated as third declension adjectives. Even ultior here is treated as a third declension adjective in the comparative degree. Okay? Superlative. How do we form the superlative? Well, in English, obviously, we put EST. Or we can use the helping words most, these little adverbs, or very. She is very pretty. We use very. Or uh, he is most handsome. We use these words here. Or we just simply put EST, depending on our usage, what we're comfortable with. This is called the superlative degree. So how would, how would we say the tallest building? How would we say the tallest person? We put isimus, A-L-T, let me put the stems down here first, A-L-T, F-O-R-T, and put I-S-S-I-M-U-S, again, I-S-S-I-M-U-S, regardless of the type of adjective, we treat both of them the same. And these are both declined in the first and second declension as superlatives. I'm just going to abbreviate declension like that. So the tallest boy would be altissimus puer. The bravest girl would be fortissima puella. These are declined in the first and second declensions. The superlative, the comparative is declined in the third declension. And of course, the positive degree, it depends on the type of adjective. If you have, if you have a first and second declension adjective, it's going to get declined in the first and second declension. If you have a third declension adjective, it will be declined in the third declension. So here's the degrees of comparison. This is your normal. This is the regular comparison. Do we have exceptions to this? We sure do. We have them in English. And we have it in, well, let me leave this up here so you can see the difference. We don't say good, good, or goodest normally. The word good has an irregular comparison in English. So, if I, so we say good, better, and best. Well, Latin does the same thing. Latin has about six adjectives that are used very commonly. They're listed for you on page 131 in the middle in your book there. In fact, everything I'm talking about is listed on pages 130 and 131 in your textbook. So just like it's a regular good, better, best in English, it's a regular in Latin too. And of course, it's easy to get these down because they're so commonly used. So the word for good, you know, is bonus. That's nothing new there. That's the positive degree. But the word for better is going to be malleus. Or excuse me, malior. Malleus is, going, is the uh, neuter form. Malior, notice it does have the I-O-R, but the stem is completely different from the positive stem, the comparative stem here. And the best is, is, is going to look like a familiar English word, opt, um, optimus which is where we get that word optimal from, optimus. Notice there's no isimus in here, but there is a mus, meaning that it is declined. So here's an example, a very common example, of an irregular comparison in Latin and English. Bonus, melior, optimus. These have to be memorized. They are so common, they must be memorized. And of course, by now, as second year Latin students, you have techniques down to memorize things, all your little devices. I just write them out to memorize it. I, I write it out and write it out until I get it right. So I do that with anything I need to memorize. Or you can use associations and that kind of thing. So the, um, if you take a study skills course, you will get all these little memory devices to use with charts and lists of words and that kind of thing. So you see in your book here on page 131, bonus, malus, magnus, multus, and parvus all very common adjectives in any language have irregular comparisons in Latin and English. We don't say bad, bad, or baddest. We say bad, worse, worst. Well, Latin is no different. Here they're saying for uh, malus, bad, peor, worse, and pessimus, worst. Very bad. Same thing with uh, parvus, minor, minimus. Small, smaller, smallest. So when you, you have a dial on your radio, it says min and max comes from the superlative degrees of these irregular comparisons. Okay, one other item before we start uh, putting these in. Remember, this, is, this uh, CD is an explanatory CD. Ordinarily, if this were a regular classroom, we would move into putting, 
get, get, getting examples and having you do work and exercises. This is what you'll be doing online. This is an, a, an adjunct, an ancillary to what you're already doing online. Just a further explanation. Okay, let's get, so there's a little bit of grammar we have to cover, and it is not a big deal, but it is the word quam. We have seen, quam can be a lot of things in Latin, and you have to simply look at the context, how it's used in a sentence. Quam can be an adverb meaning how, how beautiful, quam pulcher, quam, can be used like that. Can also be a relative pronoun. The girl whom he pointed out. That can be puella quam. It can be that too. But in this sense here, it's going to be like a conjunction. Okay, let me bring it down here. If I say, if I say Mark is taller than his mother. Okay, Mark is taller than his mother. We can say this in Latin, taller than. We can say this in Latin in two ways. In English, we just have one way of saying it. But the Romans have two ways. They can do this. Marcus est, I'll use English word order here, altior, I'm using the comparative degree, and then I can use the word quam, meaning than. And when you use quam, you use the same case before as after. If you have a nominative here, you're going to have a nominative here. Quam mater. And I'll just put his over here. I can use two words for his. I can use uh, suus, excuse me, uh, sua, modify, possessive adjective here. Or I can use aus, which is a third person pronoun of him, the mother of him. Either one of these is okay for the word his. All right. So that's one thing, I, that's the use of quam, or we can use what is called the ablative of comparison. Now, in the, the, the initial chapters in, in Latin, too, have said a lot about the accusative and the ablative case, the ablative of means, the ablative of accompaniment, the ablative of manner, the ablative used with certain adjectives. We've been over these things. They're not major points in grammar because you can see these being used in any Latin text. Here, um, we have the, the ablative of comparison. Again, it's not a major item. And, it, uh, and I don't think it's mentioned uh, here. No, I don't see it mentioned in page 131, but I'm going to mention it anyway for just so you do see it. They can take this out and simply put this word here, that what is being compared with in the ablative case. So I can say Marcus est altior matre putting mater in the ablative, third declension noun in the ablative singular ends in E, matre, matre sua, right there, okay? So this is the ablative of comparison, and this is simply the word quam used for comparison, okay? So that takes care of, you might say, chapter 24, and then getting into chapter 25, it's a little less complicated because it's the adverb. Adverbs, as we know, are not declined and they don't have to agree with anything. They simply modify other verbs or they could uh, other words. So let's take an example that they have in the book here. We have the regular comparison of adverbs and we have irregular comparison and they're mentioned here on page 132. There's irregular comparison there and again this is not any big deal. In, uh, we, again we have positive Comparative, I'm just going to abbreviate here, and superlative. We're talking about adverbs now, right here. We just, we just uh, finished talking about adjectives. Positive, comparative, and superlative. Have we already had uh, uh, adverbs? Sure we have. Let's take, um, let's, how do we form adverbs in English? We simply put ly. For example, uh, qu quick, quickly. If something is done quickly. So we put ly to form our adverbs. Latin puts an E. Um, if it comes from, it puts an E if it comes from a first and second declension noun. Uh, for example, altus can also mean deep. It, it means high. It can also mean, so I take altus, the adjective, and to make an adverb out of it, I cut off the ending 
and put an E there. You will see this on the National Latin exam. Every year they have this. So alte means deeply. He felt very deeply about his mistake. Now, how do we, uh, and a third, let's put a third declension uh, adjective, adverb here. Let's say bravely. So the word for brave is fortis. Bravely, again, cut off the ending, and we put fortiter. There's a third declension adverb. Uh, rarely will you see that on the, the uh, National Latin exam for the first year. They usually pick a first and second declension adverb uh, derivative there. Okay, so that's how the adverb is formed in the positive degree. Depends on whether it comes from a first and second declension adjective or a third. R is put on a third declension adjective, the stem, and an E is put on the stem of a first and second declension adjective. Now we have deeply and bravely right here. Okay, bravely. Now for comparison, how do we say more deeply? More deeply. He felt more deeply than the rest of his family. More deeply. We simply put an I-U-S. Altius. We simply put an I-U-S. And the same thing for the third declension here too. Fortius. Put an I-U-S on the stem. That means more bravely, more deeply. And the superlative is going to look very much like the formation in the adjective. Again, we're going to take the stems here, alt and fort. And, of course, the English would be most deeply, most bravely. Again, forgive my writing. Okay, and we're going to put I-S-S-I-M-E. I-S-S-I-M-E. Altissime and fortissime. This part you will probably not see. You might see on the Latin 2, National Latin Exam, but not the Latin 1. But there's the formation. There's the comparison, the degree of comparison of the adverb. You don't decline these. Adverbs aren't declined. Adjectives and nouns are declined. But they're simply put in the sentence. And you can, you can take any. Uh, for example, saipe means often. Here's the positive degree, saipe. Saipius would mean more often. He does this more often now that he feels better. And saipissime. He does it very frequently, saipissime, very frequently. So that's how the adverb is formed. And of course, just like with the adjective, you have irregular comparisons. We have them in English. Uh, there is uh, one, two, in the middle of page 132, multus, uh, multum plus plurimum, magnopere magis maxime, maxime, very greatly. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is the, are the degrees of comparison. Very important. This is an important uh, type of, or excuse me, important facet of a Latin grammar here because you see adverbs and adjectives being compared all the time. All right? And you just fit these into sentences the same you would any, any adjective or adverb. It's just that now they, they're uh, being compared either comparatively or superlatively here. We've been using the positive ever since the beginning of the year. All right? Thank you very much. Gracias. Wobisago. Salvete discipoli. Today we're going to talk about the present participle. A participle, it, we have them in English, is a verbal adjective. For example, the loving mother. The loving mother. Any participle can be changed into a relative clause. The mother who loves. The leaping frog. The falling leaf. He saw the falling leaf. He saw the leaf with, which was falling. Okay? So we use present participles in English all the time. We have three participles in Latin. We have a present participle, a past participle, and a future participle. Today we're just going to be focusing on the present participle. What do these look like in Latin, of course? We know that a participle in English ends in, is a verb form ending in ing. That's how you recognize a participle. There's always a sign on the word saying what it is. And Latin is very good at that, uh, telling you what it is just from the way it looks. The, word, the little letter N here is going to be very important 
and NT combination, very important in identifying participles. Participles are adjectives and they're verbs. They're a verbal adjective. They have the properties of both. Adjectives can agree with nouns. Well, participles can agree with nouns. It does in English and it does in Latin. Participles are also verbal. They have tense, they have action, they come from verbs. So let's see this. Let's say the loving mother here. How do we get the participle? Well, you have to get, let's, let's get a verb to love. Amo, amare, amawi. Always start with your principal parts. Amatum. And we haven't learned this one yet, but there it is. Okay, we want the present stem, present participle, present stem. To get the present stem, we cut off the infinitive ending of the second principal part, so we're left with AMA. I take AMA, and I do this with any verb, and I add NS. Now I have my present participle. This will be declined as a third declension adjective. Let me repeat that. This will be declined as a third declension adjective Except when I get to the ablative singular, I really will have an E on there and not an I. The adjective would have, have an I. This will have an E. This is all in your book on the bottom of page 133. And there's continues with exercises on page 134. But 133 basically explains how each conjugation forms its participle. Now, I, as I decline this, it's going to be amantis, amanti. It's third declension, amantem, and amante. It's actually going to ha keep its E there. All right? So amans, am and the plural would be amantes, amantium, amantibus, amantes, amantibus. It would, would have the I-U-M in the genitive plural as an I-stem would. Okay? So the loving mother would be amans mater. Here's why I circled those letters over there. See the N here? See the NT? This is the giveaway, and you will see this on the National Latin Exam. This is the giveaway that you have a present participle, the NNT combination. You have something verbal with N and NT and third declension. It all goes together to give you your participle. Okay? Um, the other uh, conjugations, they show one from each. There's a second conjugation, they use monens there. Uh, Again, this is the stem for monere, and you simply put ns there and go down into the third declension. Uh, regens from the third declension, reg, and, uh, rege, and just add your ns, regens, regentis. And then the same, they use uh, audio, audire for the fourth declension. So you have audire, cut off the re, you've got audi, audiens. And you have to remember in the fourth declension that you want to add that, have that IE combination here. Much like the imperfect tense where you have um, audiebam, audiebas, not instead of just audiebam, audiebam. The Romans love that IE combination. So the only thing you have to be aware of here is that the fourth conjugation has that extra IE there where you would just expect I. It's not audiens, it'd be audiens. And then you simply decline it in the third declension. So just putting this in a sentence there, or we can use a sentence from the book so you can, uh, you can all see what I'm doing here. Um, I'm looking at sentence number two. Subito aliquem vidit ad se correntem. Suddenly he saw somebody, aliquem, running toward him. And it's say there referring to the subject of the sentence he saw. That's what the reflexive, adjective, or reflexive pronoun is there. But correntem is your participle uh, that is describing aliquem, someone running toward him. And so participles liven up our writing because it's an act, you get some activity in the sentence there rather than just a relative, a relative clause stuck in there. So he saw someone running toward him. He saw him tripping over the rug. It adds a little life to the uh, story, uh, to whatever you're talking about. Okay, so there is the present participle, and we'll meet later on to discuss the past participle and the future participle later on in the course. Discipli, gratias vobis ago.